Okay, <clears throat> I think we'll go ahead and get started. It is already after seven o'clock, so are your tummies full? Good. I just want to welcome you again to the uh, dinner with the doctor, and um, I'm just really glad that you have chosen to come out tonight and listen to Dr. MD talk about light and its effects on the eye, body, and mental health. As we look forward to the next dinner with the doctor, which will be in June, June 11th, it will be with Dr. Kretschmar, Dr. Joe Kretschmar. He's a gastroenterologist. He has a very interesting title, The Body, A Grand Tour. I believe his, his presentation will deal with all the different, well, not all, but many of the different systems in the body and how they um, work together. Because as the Bible says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? And um, as we think about, you know, just as we're going to talk about the eye tonight, just that one little part of our body is so complicated. Only a creator designer could um, make that, right? So that's what Dr. Kretschmar will be talking about next week. Uh, no, next week. Next time, June 11, the body, a grand, a grand tour. So I'd like to give the time over to Dr. MD, and I'll just do a little bit of an introduction. He is the president and owner of Eastview Eye Care and has been since 2005. He is a graduate of UAB School of Optometry at the Medical Center of the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and he graduated in 1997. So we're really thankful that he um, gave, is giving his time to us tonight to present. So Dr. MD. Testing, can you hear me? It's a privilege to be here tonight, and um, we like to start our dinner with the doctors with a little devotional, and so Rhoda asked me to, to do one, but uh, before we do, I'd like to start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to be out here, and we thank you for each one that's here uh, to learn about light that you created. And uh, we ask that you give me clarity of thought and clarity of speech in that uh, I communicate well so that uh, we may all benefit from being here tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So tonight we're going to talk about the effects of light on the eye, the body, and mental health. And... Um, you know, Jesus went to, this, this picture I took at 5.45, 5.49 a.m. on the Sea of Galilee in Israel, overlooking many of what Jesus would see himself. And if you read in like Mark 1, it talks about Jesus getting up early before daylight and going out to pray, and he, con he connected with his Father in heaven. And uh, I think he did that, obviously, to connect with God the Father, but um, is you'll see kind of toward the second half of our talk tonight, you'll see why I think he did that, knowing why it was important to be out at sunrise. You don't have to be at 5.49 a.m., but before 9 a.m. Um, so, but everything has a backstory, including light. And so that's what I want to start with tonight, is the backstory of light as our, for our devotional. And uh, so let me read this to you. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. The Bible mentions light 149 times. Not meaning literal, a lot of the times it was, I am the light of the world, uh, as, as Jesus said. But light was created on day one. Day two of creation, we're told uh, further into Genesis one, that God made 
uh, the firmament, firmament, the heavens, which is the atmosphere, the air. Day three, the land separated the land from the sea, and he made the grass, plants, and trees on day three. Day four, he, it says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light he made to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. On the fourth day, he makes the sun, the moon, and the stars. And some people, even Christians, will say that a day in creation actually represented millions of years of evolution. But this is one reason I don't believe that, because the plants were created on day three, and it was the sun that was to give light to the earth. Even though God, on day one, made light, he made, that mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into light, as you'll know. There's the photons and the way it, the, the wavelengths and things like that, the, the properties and behavior of light he made on day one. But it was day four that he made the sun, and if that was a million years after all the plants were made on day three, there's no way those plants could have survived. So that all the, why you're sitting here alive tonight is because of the sun. That's where you got your energy and what you ate because all that goes into the chlorophyll, goes into the plant, that's what creates the energy, and either you eat the plants or you eat the animals that eat the plants, and uh, that, goes, that creates energy for your body. Day five, God created the fish and the birds, and then day six, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So notice he created man and woman in my image or our image. It says our image. So just like the Bible talks about a man and woman, they could become one flesh, that marriage that he created on day six between a man and a woman, it was in, as in our image, as in the Trinity, meaning the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is God, but they are as one. And uh, then he also uh, told man to subdue the earth. Man was the crowning achievement of creation. And we were to portray God. Uh, and we were created in his image and his likeness. There's something else, though, on day six that he created. Most people stop there, but I want to show you something else. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed and to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to every living thing, everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw the very thing that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and in the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God created our diets, and not only our diets, but the diets of the animals. So if you've never thought about that, he, on day six, yeah, man was the, the crowning of, of creation, but he was not done creating with just man. He then created marriage, and then he created their diet as well. And then, let's move on to chapter two, and it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in, he, in it, 
He had rested from all his work which, he, which God created and made. So the seventh day, God rested, and he set it apart to sanctify something. If you have a bird sanctuary, you're setting apart something that, uh, to preserve it, okay? And, so, and, and it's a safe place for those birds to be. It's a bird sanctuary. God separated out a, a time out of time, set it apart, and made it a safe place for us to rest. And um, so uh, the seventh day is uh, a blessing, and it's more of a blessing the older you get and the busier you get, it seems, because it gives you an excuse to rest and to be outside, and uh, a little bit later you'll see why that is so important. So, um, I just want to comment here. Sometimes we work so hard to buy the roses in life that we don't take time to smell them. The Sabbath is designed to help us stop and smell the roses of life and actually enjoy the things God created. And uh, it's so pertinent to our talk today because we can use the Sabbath to uh, enhance our health so these are our learning objectives tonight, and uh, we're gonna cover the I, the first half of the lecture, and then we're gonna cover the body and health kind of together in the second half of the lecture. But before we do that, we've gotta talk about science, and then we gotta talk about physics. And so before you cringe and it brings up too many bad memories, I just wanna cover what science is, and the reason I'm doing this is because there are some people that believe you can't believe in what the Bible says and, and what God says and believe in science. And I want to tell you that God created science. He says, come let us reason together. And uh, he made creation so that we could study it. So what is science? It's the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation, experimentation, and the testing of theories against the evidence obtained. What is physics? Physics is the branch of science concerned with many things, one being light. So tonight we're gonna to talk about physics. So if you remember physics, you remember this uh, prism. And this is called a prismatic effect and sunlight coming through a prism, you can actually, it, it uh, diffracts the light into the visible light spectrum on the wall. So if you remember the Roy G. Biv, the red, orange, yellow, blue, uh, indigo, and violet, that's what Roy G. Biv is. Does that ring a bell to anybody? But the actual light spectrum is just a very, very narrow part of the total electromagnetic spectrum. So on the far left, you have gamma rays, and then you have x-rays, and ultraviolet, and then you have the narrow little part of the visible spectrum that you and I can see and then on the keep going and the longer wavelengths are down with the infrared and the radar, FM, TV, shortwave, and AM uh, uh, radio waves. So uh, again, this is backwards, so it's Vib G Yor on this slide instead of uh, Roy G Biv. But this is a neat slide because this one shows the penetration of the electromagnetic spectrum all the way across and what actually reaches the Earth. So I want, to sh I want to point out to most of the electromagnetic spectrum is blocked by our atmosphere. Only a little bit gets through, and that would be the UV uh, in the visible and some of the near infrared, and then the, a lot of this is blocked, and then, so, and then of course the radio waves get through. And what's interesting about this is uh, NASA knew this, and so if you've heard of these X-ray telescopes, that reach out into outer space. The reason they have them, they can't, you can't use an X-ray telescope on ground because you won't see anything. There's no X-rays that get through the atmosphere. So they have to be put up above, above that, and we have the Chandra X-ray Observatory that was put up in 1999, and this is the images. You've probably seen this image before and didn't realize it was an X-ray image of the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is the visible light that we could see, and this is the X-ray image that that telescope sees, and this would be the uh, composite of both, and, it, and, and looking at 
more than just visible light gives you a little bit more of the beauty of some of these uh, galaxies. So today, for the rest of our lecture, we're only going to be talking about this little area right here, the UV, the visible, and the infrared. And that would be here. And so uh, if you, we go to the UV, right here, this is UVC, and it quits right here. So UVC, 100% of it is blocked in our atmosphere. And UVB would be next, and then UVA, and those are the two that we get. 95% is UVA, and 5% is UVB. Now, it's a good thing that UVC is blocked, and you'll see why here in a minute, because UVC is 100% absorbed in the cornea. And so uh, you get UVC light from things like welders and uh, uh, even some LED fluorescent um, tanning beds, certain things that you can get UVC from, and uh, you have to protect your eyes or else you'll uh, get a nice burn on the cornea. So uh, let's go into this. Uh, this is the disclosure. This is not meant to be, uh, even though I'm an eye doctor, this is for information only. So, so talk to your own individual doctor and uh, get uh, advice. This is not meant to treat anything. So we're gonna go uh, from the front of the eye to the back of the eye. And so we're gonna start with the eyelids and then the conjunctiva and the cornea, the iris, the lens, into the uh, retina and the back of the eye and, and the optic nerve. So we're gonna start with eyelid and these are uh, in order of, of how common they are. These are eyelid cancers that you get. This is basal cell carcinoma. It is by far the most common cancer that you get on your eyelid. And uh, it's got these classic uh, raised borders around here that's kind of an ulcer, like a little bit of a volcano there. This is a benign tumor, but it is not really benign because basal cell, it means that it doesn't metastasize so it usually uh, does not spread, but it can go deep. And people that have to have these excised, sometimes they have to take uh, the whole bottom eyelid off. So it's definitely not benign. The next most common is sebaceous cell carcinoma. And these are tricky because these look like styes. And so uh, you've probably all experienced a sty here or there. But, uh, and, and the crazy thing about these is um, they can actually kind of move on the eyelid. So if you have a recurrent sty that's not healing, you need to make sure and tell your, uh, talk to your eye doctor. Now this, one is, this one's bad, this is squamous cell carcinoma. This one's deadly, and uh, luckily it's not very common, although uh, a month ago I had a patient come in that uh, said at the end of the exam, he said, it was a glaucoma patient, so I see him about every three or four months, and he said, I just want to thank you, and I said, for what? And he said, because uh, last time I was in, you told me I better have this place on my nose checked out and turned out to be uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So they got it and uh, might have saved his life because these, these are deadly, as well as melanoma are deadly as well. And here's the, here's the thing, uh, UV triggers these things. I mean, it's, it's, there's a high correlation with UV exposure and this. What eyelid was affected on every one of these, upper or lower? Lower, now why would that be? Because God designed an eyebrow, and the eyebrow creates shade when you're outside, and so the sunlight hits more down here and not as much. You can still get them anywhere, but they're much more common on the lower eyelid, and uh, what can't you put, what don't you want to put around your eyes that you put all over your skin when you go out in the sun? Sunscreen. So if you're going to get it, you're more likely to get it where the sunscreen isn't applied. And uh, so let's keep on going back a little bit. We're going to go to the cornea. This is what we call SPK or superficial punctate keratitis, and this is a welder's burn. It's the same exact thing as snow blindness, if you've heard of snow blindness. Uh, welder's keratitis, it's the, uh, it's the UVB, for, for snow blindness, it would be the UVB bouncing off of the uh, snow and reflecting back. So not only do you get it straight on, but you get a, a huge intense uh, amount of UV in your cornea. 
you won't feel this the day you go skiing or when you look at the welder's light, you won't feel that that day. You think you're fine until the next day. It's like this. And this is painful because every one of these little dots on there is where the epithelial cell is dead on the front of the cornea. And you have more nerves per square millimeter on the front of your cornea than any other place in your body. So a little speck in your eye, you know what it feels like. It can hurt, level 10 pain sometimes, depending on if it's hitting right on one of the nerves. This is uh, very painful. So intelligent people um, usually only have this once. <laughs> Hopefully you know what I mean by that. Because if, you, if you're smart, you're not gonna do that again. Uh, I had a guy come in and he installed a uh, HVAC system that had a UV filter in it, okay? And so they, you know, they put it in there and they, he puts the HVAC unit and the next unit is the UV uh, filter and it comes with a pair of glasses that are orange or yellow looking and he's like, I don't need these. And he goes in there and he, is this thing on and he turns it on and off and on and off, make sure it, it works and yeah, he can see the blue light and everything and he's like, okay. And so he's done, he goes home well, the next morning he comes in and his, both of his corneas look just like this. And I said, did you wear the glasses that came with the uh, unit? And he's like, what, what, no, why? And I'm like, because they were to protect your eyes as you installed that. That's why they sent you the glasses. So obviously he didn't read the instructions, but um, I have a feeling, because he was in level 10 pain, and I have a feeling that will be the only time that will happen to him. By far, this is the most common UV uh, uh, lesion that we see, and it's called a pinguecula. Probably 80% of you have this if you look hard enough under the microscope. When I first saw this in school, I thought it was a tumor. And it's just a proliferation of the skin. It's like a callus that you get on your hand, and uh, it's just a buildup of tissue there, and it can get inflamed and you get a pinguiculitis, but these pinguiculas are very, very common, and um, they can cross over the limbus area. Now, the limbus area is the border of the conjunctiva, which is the transparent membrane that covers the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, and this is the limbus. So once the pinguicula crosses over the limbus region, then we call it a pterygium. And pterygiums are very, very common. They are definitely associated, so is uh, uh, the pinguicula, with UV exposure. And so the closer you are to the equator, the more common these are. And the more you see them, because most people have brown eyes down there. And so uh, when I was in Peru, I had a 30-year-old patient. Uh, we were down in the Amazon uh, River, three hours up from Iquitos, Peru, close to the equator and he was totally blind in both eyes from pterygia. Now these are easily removed and they can peel these away, but uh, there's, there used to be about a 50% recurrence rate they can grow back, but now with mitomycin C, and uh, they, they can get that recurrence rate a little bit lower, but very common. And then of course you can have a tumor as well on the conjunctiva, and uh, we call that ocular surface squamous neoplasia, it looks, right here, you really can't see it, but it's got these classic corkscrew feeder vessels, and this is strongly associated with uh, not only UV, but HIV, and also HPV, the human papillomavirus, and, and it's very common in, in Africa. So let's keep going, the iris, uh, as, we, as we move back. So here is a little nevus right there, real common, just like a nevus on your arm. This one's a little bit more suspicious Dr. Stonecipher should recognize this one because she just saw this patient, this new patient to our practice. That, that one you probably won't forget for a while because it is kind of strange looking because it's not round, it's got these little arms. You just watch that and you make sure it doesn't turn into anything worse. This is a patient I've seen for over 25 years. Lots of, lots of iris nevi. These are as common as they are on your skin, except your doctor would say, um, you know, we'll just, just watch it and let me know if it changes. And uh, we would say the same thing. These are a little bit easier to see the changes when you have a good picture like this. And this is the other eye. So these are nothing to worry about, and they, he's been the same for 25 years. This one is one Dr. Shaw should actually uh, 
recognize because this is one of her patients. This is a patient that we've seen in our clinic for, uh, well, at least, be, well, before 2005, and I think you, you saw her uh, over at, regional, or at uh, Greenville Eye Clinic when you were with Dr. Smead over there, uh, too. And it had been stable, stable, stable for literally a couple of decades. And uh, then when she was 37 years old, um, she came in with pink eye providentially, because it was in the other eye, and Dr. Shaw looked at the pink eye and then just happened to look over here and noted that it had changed in appearance. And that's the, that's the hallmark. When, when you see anything change, that's when you uh, get a biopsy. And it turned out to be an iris melanoma. And uh, so off to Vanderbilt, uh, she went, and she is, I just looked in her record, she's still 20-20 to this day, doing great, five years out. So we keep on going uh, back a little bit further. This is the, the, now we're at the lens, and of course this is the cataracts. And this is uh, the world's leading cause of blindness, and most of the blindness is in India, for whatever reason, just because there's a lot of people in India, but it might be their diet. I'm not sure why most people, most of the world's blindness is in India, but most of it's cataract. So uh, very easy to treat now, and uh, with, uh, five to 10 minute surgery, and they usually start, this is a cortical cataract, this is a nuclear sclerosis cataract, basically with, in some cortex. This is a cortical cataract that looks like spokes of a wheel, and we usually see this develop again down in the lower part of the lens because that's where the sun shines, and that's where it hits. And this is an interesting graph right here because this map shows the, um, the, uh, th and this was done, by the way, at the Kellogg uh, Eye Center in uh, Michigan, the University of Michigan, up there. And so uh, the map shows, though, the age that the patient was when they first had their cataract surgery. The darker areas are when they're older, when they need surgery, and the lighter areas are when they're younger and they need surgery. So if you look at Oregon versus Texas, you can see that the patients up here are older in general when they need cataract surgery than they are closer to the equator in a lower latitude in Texas. Now, why is Florida like that? You'd think it'd be white as well, but you gotta remember that most of the Floridians are from north and they're retiring down there, so I think that's interesting. But anyhow, then this one, uh, any given age is the percentage of patients who needed cataract surgery. So this is how many in the population at age 50 or at age 60. And uh, you can see in the higher elevations where the atmosphere is thinner and you have more UV exposure, those people end up having more cataract surgery at uh, that particular given age than people, say, in the East Coast. So we'll move back in the eye a little bit further. Now we're gonna be in the retina and in the macula. And of course yesterday, uh, if you were in Mohawk, you didn't see this, but uh, because down here we had rain. And uh, I went outside several times and I couldn't even see my shadow and so uh, very disappointing. But a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, people saw a great eclipse. So, you have to protect your eyes, and if this is a normal eye, this is someone who didn't protect their eyes, and this happens to be a 15-year-old that, uh, see this little blip right there and a little tiny blip right there? It burns a hole right in the center of your eye, and it can be permanent. Here's a 50-year-old, same thing, a little blip there, a little blip right there, and that happens right dead center in the macula, macula means bullseye. And so that's where it hits, and so if this would be your normal vision, that's what you'd see. So that little dot in the middle uh, would be a place that where you'd have a, a blind spot, a permanent, or it could be a temporary scotoma, but it could be a permanent scotoma or, or blind spot. And uh, macular degeneration affects the same area. Um, 11 million people have that, and there's two forms, and we've got dry and wet, and I'm not gonna get into a lot of this, but uh, this is where, again, if this is a normal macula right here, you can see these, these drusen, which are little white areas, and that's accumulation of waste buildup in there, 
and uh, it oxidizes, it causes free radical damage, and then you get the damage to the photoreceptors, and it can take out your um, center, it can make a little blip right there as well. And so this happens to be my mom's left eye when she was alive, and that she had just a little tiny blip, and when she'd look at a door frame, she'd, halfway down was a little uh, blip in the, in the door frame. And it causes these, this metamorphopsia on the Amsler grid and just some distortion there where the, where the retina isn't functioning real well. Luckily, if it's a small area like my mom's, it's not that big of a deal, but it can be huge like this, and it can bleed. And this is what we call wet macular degeneration. And when this bleeds, then uh, what happens is, excuse me, the, underneath the retina in the choroid layer, which is a layer of, of solid blood and blood vessels, it bursts through the retina itself and bleeds into the macula and uh, blocks the vision there. And we call that a choroidal neovascular membrane. So if your vision would be like this and you had that kind of bleed, your vision would be like that. And so you still have your peripheral vision, but you would not have the fine detail in the middle. And so back 20 years ago, before they had the treatments, uh, people that got this, they ended up losing a lot of their vision. Now we have all kinds of uh, anti-VEGF medicines that treat this. Geographic atrophy is another one. It's a dry form. You've probably seen advertisements on TV for a new medicine that came out last year. There's two new medicines, not as good as the anti-VEGF, but better than nothing. It can destroy your central vision as well. So uh, then we look at choroidal nevi. This happens to be uh, Angela's retina. And so the, uh, that would be something. I've watched her for 30 years, and these two have not changed since I was in school. And this one is really high risk for choroidal melanoma. I referred him up a couple years ago to um, Dr. Larzo in um, John City, and then he's, there's a, there's a uh, retinal oncologist in Chattanooga who is, is uh, now seeing this patient. And uh, these, are dead, these can be deadly. I had one patient that actually, if these metastasize to the liver, you die within five years 100%. And so they're, they're uh, underneath the, if you, so we always scan these patients, and if you see fluid underneath it like that, that's not a, not a good sign. So what can you do, uh, we're talking about the eyes here, of course sunglasses, wear sunglasses. When I go to Bolivia and Peru and some of these places, we take hundreds of pairs of sunglasses with us, especially the kids, because they're the ones that are the most susceptible. Wear big broad rimmed hats to block the, the UV. And what can you do other? You can have a colorful plate of food every time you eat. Uh, whether it's breakfast and fruits and things, whether it's this, my favorite uh, salad that Angela makes of kale. It's a raw kale salad. And I don't mean a colorful plate of Fruit Loops or Skittles. I mean healthy, healthy plant-based food. So the second half, we're going to talk about how light can affect the body and health. And of course, the thing that you think of most is the skin cancers. And, um, but what I really want to talk about is what's called photobiomodulation. Now, photobiomodulation bio uh, is a hot topic in the last 20 years, but especially in the last few years. You can't see down here, but this is back in like 1990, 2000, and that is 2022. And right here, that line right there is 6,000 studies per year. So there's over 6,000 studies done now that are published on photobiomodulation. Now, what in the world is that? Photo means light, of course. Bio means living cells, and modulation means to exert an influence on. So it, photobiomodulation describes the biochemical reactions that occur in living cells in response to light. So this guy, have you guys heard of Roger Schwelt? Many of you, some of you, okay. Some of you have. He is amazing. Uh, he has a, you, you can go on YouTube and watch his videos. This top one right here, he did two years ago, Light as Medicine. I, I, I'm stealing a lot of the information tonight from that lecture. That has over four million hits on YouTube, okay, just in the last two years. And uh, so lots of COVID research, lots of, he, this guy is quadruple board certified. All right, let me tell you what that means. That means he's board certified in internal medicine, Pulmonary disease, that means he's a lung specialist. 
He's a critical care, he's board certified in critical care and in sleep medicine. So he's a sleep specialist, a pulmonologist, uh, internist, and uh, he treated a ton of COVID and has done a lot of research um, and published his own studies on, on uh, this. One of his slides is this circadian rhythm, and we all have this, and this dim light melatonin onset happens around 9 p.m. if you're in line with reality, reality meaning the sun, okay? And so melatonin helps you go to sleep, right? And so you want that. And this starts around 9 p.m., and then around, uh, what is it, 7.30 a.m., it stops and cortisol levels rise. Now, cortisol is not good if it's coming straight from stress, but you have to have cortisol to wake up. And so you, get, you want cortisol and you want melatonin suppressed, uh, systemic melatonin that is, suppressed during the day so that you can wake up. And this is so critical that interference with the circadian rhythm, okay, is now classified by the World Health Organization as a probable carcinogen. Now let me explain what that means. That means if I mess with your sleep, like shift work does, like night shifts and things like that, it probably causes cancer. That's what that means, okay? And that's classified, and, and what you might not realize is that melatonin, and this is really important to understand, melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants known to man, okay? So it is twice as strong as vitamin E is, and vitamin E is a very strong antioxidant. So how would you, so, so it would make sense, but here's what's interesting, is this, there's, a, there's a positive association uh, with melatonin and breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and not just cancer, but also heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and cognitive impairment. That means you can't think right. And other conditions. So the circadian rhythm is so important that you don't mess with that and that you're in sync with reality, uh, that if it's not, it's hugely affecting, affecting you. Now here's a, another interesting, it says reduced cancer incidence in totally blind people. Okay, now this is interesting because if you're not blind, which I'm assuming you can see me, that means if your circadian rhythms are messed up and you're at higher risk of cancer, if I sever both optic nerves, now you're not at higher risk for cancer. Now why is that? Let's talk about this. So what happens is light, let me, let me back up, in normal vision. So normal vision, light comes in the eye, stimulates the, the rods and cones in the photoreceptors in the, in the retina. They're connected to the retinal ganglion cells and they are, those retinal ganglion cell axons go all the way through the optic nerve. They go to the, the LGN or the lateral geniculi, nucleus and then onto the occipital lobe in the back of the brain, and that's where your vision computer is. That's normal vision that you think of. There's several other pathways that light triggers, one being this one, and it's this light, especially high up in your visual field, that comes in and stimulates the retinal ganglion cells directly, not the photoreceptors, but directly the, the, the retinal ganglion cells that are called um, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. It's in the inferior part of the retina. That sends a signal to the superior chi uh, chiasmatic nucleus. That just means that it's the nuclei that's above the optic chiasm, where the optic nerves cross in the middle of your head. I just, that's all that means. And uh, that then signals the pineal gland to re re release melatonin, okay? But, the, but, I'm sorry, the light stops that. So normally, uh, this, the pineal gland is, is producing melatonin, but when there's light, then it stimulates this and it shuts down this pathway. 
In the absence of light, the pineal gland produces melatonin. So if you're totally blind, your body produces lots of melatonin. And melatonin is a, a fantastic antioxidant, okay? And so um, that's why the blind people have less risk of that. So notice, though, the peak sensitivity of these uh, special retinal ganglion cells. Peak sensitivity is 460 and 484. Now, what's that? If we go to our visible light spectrum, what color is this? Is it blue or red? It's blue. So blue light, specifically. Why is blue light bad? Because blue light shuts down melatonin production. All, any light will, but especially blue light. And so, as we said earlier, it can lead to all kinds of problems. So where do we get blue light? Well, we get blue light from the sun. Most of the blue light you get is from the sun. And in the evening, the sun is a different color, okay? And then, so it gets dark now, and what do you do? You turn on your LED TV, you turn on your LED lights, you turn on your LED computer screen, you turn on your LED laptop, you turn on your LED tablet, and you turn on your LED phone. And what's that telling your retina? That it's daytime, that the sun is up. And in a couple of hours, you're supposed to go to sleep. So people like Dr. Schwelt, who are sleep specialists, the, if you're having trouble sleeping, the very first thing they'll tell you is no screen time, no devices after 6 p.m., okay? When the sun starts going down, don't turn on your bright lights. That's not the time that you wanna turn on your daytime lights. If you look at this, they did a study on eBooks, like on a tablet, like an iPad, versus a paper book and how much light is emitted and where it was in the spectrum. And if you notice, paper, the print book is down here, this bottom line, hardly any problem, hardly any light coming into the eye. An iPad gives a lot of irradiation and especially in the blue light spectrum right here. So it's mostly, I mean, it's blue light is what it is coming off of there. So that's the reason if I'm ever on my phone at night, I have a special pair of reading glasses that block 100% of blue light. And uh, there's a time and place for blue light protection, and when it is, is if you live in a modern world and you've gotta be on your devices or you're preparing for a lecture, <laughs> uh, you have to be on these things. We live in a modern world, but you can be smart about it, and you don't have to expose yourself. So turn on your night shift mode on all your devices, the blue light filters that now come in a lot of these. You, you can buy uh, blue light filter glasses. Um, there's only one really out there that um, has a, the, the, it's patented, it's very expensive, especially if you get your prescription in it, it's called Blue Tech lenses, but you, and it blocks 100%, uh, absolutely 100% of light. You can do some, uh, Sabrina uh, and Jackie can do some finance, you know, finagling with a poly blue, clue fil blue filter and some of these other things to, to get nearly 100% of blue light protection as well. But uh, I like my uh, yellow uh, blue tech lenses that sit right next to my bed so I can go to sleep very quickly and very easily. But if you're on an ebook, this is another study that they did, on average it takes you anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes longer to fall asleep. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but you do that every night, and you will have chronic sleep deprivation. And what does chronic sleep depriva deprivation do? It creates all kinds of problems, which you're gonna see with the glymphatic system here in a little bit, but chronic inflammation and all kind of uh, problems like that. So, any light exposure, especially up above, coming down, hitting your lower retina, is telling your brain it's daytime. It messes with your circadian rhythm. It can actually cause cancer, is what I'm telling you, okay? And this is well known, well documented. And uh, so, be careful and take it seriously, and uh, don't stay up late. Now, 
this is an interesting slide in my opinion because we're gonna shift a little bit here. Um, in recent times, this was only discovered in 2012 for the first time. So it's not been that long, just over 10 years ago. And they didn't know how the brain, well we didn't know exactly why we slept, to be honest. They knew that sleep was necessary and the animals that they made stay awake died. And they didn't know why we needed sleep. In 2012, we, had a better understanding, and they found that there is a whole system called the glymphatic system within our brains, and this is the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid that bathes our brains. This is it pumping all day long that cleanses the metabolic waste buildup, the exhaust of the engines of the cells in the, in the brain, and it keeps it clean, okay? But it's a kind of a gentle cleansing, and what they found is that the, the uh, Astrocytes, these glial cells in the brain, their feet go down to the blood vessels and 98.4% of all blood vessels in your brain have this. And these glial feet, if this, is the, uh, if this is the blood vessel, they go and they surround it like this and it's kind of like a straw with a bigger straw around it and the space in between those two straws is the glymphatic vessel. And so what they found is that as soon as you go to sleep, the CSF starts getting pumped way deep into your brain, fa fast. And they first saw this in mice, and this is called the, uh, known as the virchow robin space. And they saw it in mice because when they injected dye into their brains, they could actually see through the skull and, and the dye would disappear down deep into the brain. And they're like, how did that happen so quick? And then they, and it, and it was in anesthetized mice, and so they were asleep, and that's what got them thinking about this. So what happens is that these are blood vessels, and these are different, blood vessels in the brain are different than blood vessels in your kidneys or your liver. They go in together into the organs, usually, and in your brain, the blood vessels are separated like this. And they're, they're separated because God knew what he was doing when he designed it. Because here comes the CSF in here, in the potential space around that artery. It comes away, it comes across. And as we sleep, about 10 o'clock at night on everybody, again, if you're lined up um, with reality, uh, the, the brain cells, what they found is that the energy in the brain is not it's, it's, it's the same level as during the day. And it's like, well, wh how can that be? We're not thinking, we're not doing, we're not singing, we're not doing anything. You know, what, why is the same amount of energy expended at night as during the day? And what they found was that at night, as soon as you go to sleep, the brain cells literally shrink, which creates the extracellular space to expand by like 60%. And that basically sucks in this fluid and it comes in and uh, washes the waste away over to the venous side, or the vein side over here. And then that's how the brain takes care of itself. And you know this already because if you stay up late at night and you don't get good sleep early on, you ha kinda have brain fog the next morning. You know, you're not at your, you're not at your best. And uh, so you feel a lot better when you go to bed early and uh, you get this, this deep cleansing. And, and uh, I call it the, the pot scrubber cycle. And this happens at about 10 o'clock, as I said. And if you stay up beyond that and you go to bed at midnight, you miss the, the pot scrubbing cycle. Like in your dishwasher, that's a stronger wash, okay? And if you see the videos of it, it literally is scrubbing the brain like that. And so um, you get gentle cleansing after midnight, but you don't get that, that really cl deep clean. And what happens then is it puts you at more risk. For decades, we've known that night owl people that stay up late, they're at more risk for neurodegenerative diseases. So what ends up happening is you get beta amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies in Parkinson's, intranuclear inclusions in Huntington's, prion amyloid plaques, and ALS aggregates. 
And two other things that are classified as neurodegenerative diseases now are glaucoma and macular degeneration, which I treat every day. And so um, this was a quote that many of you know and have heard from over 100 years ago by Ellen White. And she says, I know from the testimonies given me from time to time for brain workers that sleep is worth far more before than after midnight. Two hours of good sleep before 12 o'clock is worth more than four hours after midnight. Isn't that interesting? And so she didn't know the science behind it, but we do now. And uh, here's another interesting study that just came out last fall. And this was a, a meta-analysis of 34 different studies. Okay, so this just wasn't one study. This looked at 34 different studies and found that people that were on their screens, screen time, the more screen time they had, the lower the cognitive ability. That means you're not as smart, you can't think, and specifically, it was sustained attention, okay? So sustained attention means you can't focus on things for very long. And so, lower cognitive function, and it didn't matter what they were doing. You'd think, well, they were video games. Well, a lot of video gamers are like that. Uh, but it was web surfing. It didn't matter what it was. It, they just didn't think right. And so, when the Bible says, come, let us reason together, in the Old Testament, Isaiah, and in the New Testament, it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so that with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. If your mind is not thinking right, how are you going to come let us reason together and serve the law of God with your mind? Both in the Old and New Testaments tell us to do that. It's a sobering thought. And so I want to show you this picture. Which of these two, knowing what you know now with blue light in the superior visual field being the highest risk, which one of these is healthy and which one is not healthy if you were going to live there or be there? A low campfire of red light, orange red light, versus LEDs galore in New York uh, keeping you up all night, it's, you're going to be very much healthier in, in that situation. So Ellen White also said this, make it a habit not to sit up after 9 o'clock. Every light should be extinguished. This turning night into day is a wretched, health-destroying habit. This was in 1888. They didn't have LED lights, but isn't that interesting? I think she was on track there. So we've looked at a lot of bad with light, but there's a lot of good, and this is the exciting part. So this is what I really want you to know here. So you know about UVB creating vitamin D, okay? And so that was, uh, a lot of people took vitamin D during the pandemic because, you know, they, early on they thought that vitamin D was really beneficial. And of course it prevents rickets, and they've known that for, uh, hundreds of years, actually, the 1600s. And here's a myth. So I always heard that if you're out in sunlight and then you come in and take a shower, you'll wash the vitamin D right off your skin. And uh, so I came across this, and I had to put it in there just to, to break that myth. Most of this UVB radiation is absorbed in the epidermis. And as a result, when exposed to sunlight, most of the vitamin D3 that's produced in the skin is made inside the living cells in the epidermis. This is the reason that why after exposure to sunlight, vitamin D3 remains in the skin even when the skin is washed with soap and water immediately after the exposure to sunlight. And if you think about it, it's like, yeah, okay, the, it's true because the vitamin D3 is actually inside the cell. You're not going to really wash that away. But that's been a myth I've heard for quite a few years, actually. So anyhow, I came across that, and I'm like, I have to put that in. So going back to this slide... Remember the light in the upper visual field hitting the uh, special uh, retinal ganglion cells in the lower retina? Well, it not only hits, it goes to the uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus, it also goes to the peri 
habenular nucleus, and that stimulates uh, mood. It affects our mood, okay? So here are the intensities, and I want you to look down here. So in, in uh, office lighting, it's about 320 lux to 500. I got a call this morning, actually, from uh, one of the uh, plant managers it's at uh, either Green County Schools or Greenville City Schools, and his question was, we have to have a, a 550 lux or, or 50 foot candles, which I think is a near 550 or something uh, lumens at the desk in these schools, but a lot of the teachers are wanting to bring in incandescent lights, and they, they uh, found that the students behave better with that, and so he's like, you know, I've got to meet the standard, and do you have any literature? And I'm like, you need to come to my lecture tonight. I happen to be working on this right now as we speak. And, uh, but anyhow, as we go, so if this is normal office lighting, uh, your family living room might be at 50. I just want to point out to you, what, look at full daylight right here, 10,000 to 25,000, and if you're in direct sunlight, 32 to up to 130,000. Okay, that's why I like sunny days, even if it's cloudy. Even overcast is way better than my dark exam room at my office that I'm in every day. So I love sunlight, and I try to, if it's sunny, I try to be outside as much as I can. Well, if you don't get enough sunlight, 5% of people suffer from SAD, which is the seasonal affective disorder, which you've heard about. And these symptoms can be up to 40% uh, of, have symptoms throughout the year the, of the people that actually have this. And uh, so what they did is to treat this, they, you would look at a light for four days at 3,000 lux, which is nowhere close to being outside, but that's what they did. And sure enough, and these are, uh, this was a, a multi-study uh, review as well, and overall, it definitely had an effect on their uh, SAD disorder. And so you can, you can get these um, special lights that you can look into, you know, for 30 minutes in the morning. And it's about a 10,000 lux. You can buy them on Amazon. And it boosts your mood. And it can really help the, the people that are affected by this. We don't have it as much here. But like out in Portland, Oregon, and some of these places that are cloudy a lot, they uh, suffer more. You can also buy these uh, dawn simulation lights. And they found that lights that go from zero and gradually like a rising of the sun, that benefited people. And it made them happier. And so they now pre-program these light bulbs to where they come on at whatever time you tell it to, and then they gradually get brighter and brighter is, is in your room that you're in. And it and it helps this as well. But I want to shift our focus, no pun intended, or pun actually intended. We've been talking about the ultraviolet spectrum. We've been talking about blue light and the visible spectrum. But I want to talk about infrared, because this is really exciting. The mitochondria in the cells, now we're going back to biology, sorry, microbiology. The mitochondria in the cell is the energy house. It's the actual engine in the cell. Okay, and so just like engines produced exhaust in your car, mitochondria produce this as well, okay? And what happens is this oxidation, this oxidative stress, what we call it reactive oxygen species, creates damage to the cells. So at night, we've talked about how melatonin is produced, and that helps combat it's an antioxidant, remember I said that? So oxidation of the tissue is when these oxidative free radicals form and they damage the tissue, whether it's in the retina or in the skin. That's what aging is, is oxidation of the skin and you get wrinkles, okay? So antioxidants or diets high in antioxidants, like colorful plate of foods, will block that, but melatonin is one of the strongest. So at night, that's why we have it. And it is a systemic melatonin. So what that means is that it floods in your blood system, and it, it's a hormone. And it goes throughout your whole, whole body and creates a sleepiness to help us sleep as well. 
But in the daytime, what they have now found is that sunlight directly triggers the mitochondria themselves to produce melatonin. This is not systemic melatonin. This is localized melatonin within the actual cell. It doesn't affect anything around it, just that cell. In fact, what they found is that 95% of all melatonin produced in your body is actually at the mitochondrial level now. This was just discovered, okay? So the important thing that you need to know about this is the, the question always comes up, what about supplements? Man, oh, I should, melatonin's good, I should supplement. Yeah, melatonin's good short term. It can help people you know, sleep if you're traveling or something like that. But long term, it's a hormone and it can mess up your circadian rhythms. It's not a good thing to take long term. That's why there's many countries, the UK, Japan, uh, the, the whole European Union, and now Canada, that you can't get melatonin over the counter. It's gotta be prescribed because you can mess up things. So you gotta be careful with melatonin. Plus, it, it's gonna make you sleepy if you take it at the wrong time of day. And this melatonin is actually produced in the mitochondria, okay? So here's what's, uh, let me uh, read this. Melatonin is produced within the mitochondria in response to sunlight and provides targeted protection of mitochondria from reacti reactive oxygen species. Accordingly, melatonin is protective against a range of diseases characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction, including cancers, neurodegenerative diseases that we just mentioned the list, cardiovascular disease, that means heart disease, and diabetes at the mitochondrial level. So it may have a role in prevention and or treatment of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and even COVID. And this was, of course, Dr. Schweltz's specialty, okay? And that's why he's so excited about this. And the, and the, the key point to this is this is subcellular localized melatonin, not circulatory melatonin, not systemic melatonin. And this is produced by the near infrared right here. So here's the light spectrum, so you can't see near infrared, okay? But here's the amazing thing about this, is that near infrared penetrates your skin. It can go, depending on the wavelength, it goes deep into your skin and you perceive it as heat. So even on a cold day, if you're in the sunlight, you feel so much warmer, and it's not because of the visible light hitting you, it's because infrared is hitting you. Okay, here we are. The far infrared is blocked in the atmosphere. It's the near infrared that actually reaches us. This is visible light, okay? And this is, this is your skin. So this is how many centimeters down the visible light will go. And red light, the longer the wavelength of light, the further it goes down. Do you want to know how far down near infrared goes? You're not going to believe me when I tell you this. Eight centimeters into your skin. Eight centimeters, that's th over three inches. My hand is an inch, half inch thick. So are you telling me that near infrared can go right through my hand, all the way through it? And I'm telling you it can. And they've imaged this, okay? So you can see right through somebody's hand with near infrared. The implication of this, I'll show you here in a minute. This shows that how much damage, how much free radical damage to parts of the light spectrum cause. You can see all this damage that we talked about the first half of the lecture is UV damage. Then visible light and this is important to know, UV light cannot reach the retina. All UV light, UVA and UVB, is absorbed in the cornea and the lens. So you don't get really any or very much uh, UV light in the, in the retina at all. So 
for macular degeneration and choroidal nevi that could turn into choroidal melanoma, that's visible light, okay? So that's why it's important to wear sunglasses because you wanna block the visible light coming in the retina. Now, near infrared hardly has any damage. It's a longer wavelength yet, so it has even less damage. And what's nice is that near, near infrared goes right through sunglasses. So wearing sunglasses doesn't inhibit the, the melatonin in the mitochondria within your eye tissues and your eye cells. And this just shows that it doesn't matter if you're melanin-rich skin or uh, more Caucasian, you still get eight centimeters depth of penetration into the skin. Near infrared can penetrate clothing, unlike UV. So clothing typically blocks UV. Near infrared can go right through it. In fact, this slide shows that one different clothes block different amounts of near infrared though. So if you want to go outside in sunlight, you can wear a 10, 10 layers of a cotton polyester blend, 10 layers, and get the same penetrance as one layer of denim or jean material. So you don't wanna wear jeans if you're outside for health because you want more near infrared penetration into your skin, okay? And this is why. The black line right here represents the total amount of cells in your body. Visible light down here and UV hardly reach any of your cells, just on the surface. Near infrared reaches a ton of your cells, especially, this is, a, is you're a child, when you're a child and you're outside playing and not on video games, but you're outside, you have, you're the, pretty much every cell in your body near infrared can help and create tremendous melatonin locally to keep those cells healthy, okay? That's why you don't see kids with cancer very often. And you want them to be outside, but you should be outside. Now, why does it, why does it get a little bit lower as we age? Here we are as an adult. It's because we get a little bit thicker in some of our cells, some more than others. And uh, so we don't get as much near infrared penetration into our bodies, okay? But isn't that amazing that the sunlight itself gets down into your tissue and creates the antioxidants that you need? It's amazing. And so they, they did some COVID studies and they found, you know, in the fall and winter, these spikes in COVID happens. And they thought it was vitamin D. And so what they noticed is that they did studies and they, it showed that um, temperature didn't matter, humidity didn't matter, but where the country was located mattered of when the spike would occur in the number of COVID cases. And so up in Finland right here, when winter hits or fall hits on September 9, they started to spike early on. And then down in Greece, it was October 19 when fall started there, and that's when we started seeing spikes in COVID there. And so uh, maybe it was the near infrared exposure, not necessarily the vitamin D exposure. And sure enough, they did studies on this, and uh, oh, actually they replicated this um, study in the United States and in England and Italy. And up here, this is the number of deaths from COVID, and it was latitude dependent. So more people died with COVID in the United States in the further away from the equator. And it kind of makes sense when you know what near infrared does for you, right? It had nothing to do with vitamin D. And they found that it was, it was given the effect that it appears independent of the vitamin D pathway. This is an interesting graph right here because there are fluctuations in the fall and winter with other diseases that we see. 
as well. So if you look, so uh, of course here's COVID, the purple right there. But if you look at, um, let's say diabetes, for example, or chronic lower respiratory disease, there are fluctuations. So this is, this is one year. And so you can see in January 1 right here, there's always a spike around the middle of winter on all of these diseases, except for accidents. But even heart disease, Here's the spike in January, it lowers in the summer, comes back in January, lowers and spikes. Okay, isn't that interesting? And so if you know what you know now about the near-infrared stimulating your melatonin in your mitochondria, you can see why mitochondrial diseases are affected by sunlight. It's really important to be out there. And so um, the question remains though was, was there a controlled, ra actual randomized control study sh looking at infrared light and COVID? And there, there was. And it's right here. And uh, it was done in December of 2022. And what they did is they put a near-infrared jacket on people with COVID. And what they found was that they had four less days admission in the hospital better hematological numbers, uh, the lymphocytes, better oxygenation, and better pulmonary function testing, okay? And, uh, but here's the crazy thing is, I forgot what the, I didn't put that on there, but the lux on this was, was like 3,000 or, or something. It wasn't, it wasn't even close to what the sunlight provides, okay? And it still benefited them. So this was, this was January of this year, this study came out. And the world, uh, economic, at the world Economic Forum in Switzerland, they were discussing about these future pandemics and disease X. Okay, so we're being told that there are gonna definitely be pandemics. And this disease X, whatever that is, is going to be potentially 20 times worse than COVID. Okay, it's scary. But now that you know what you know, it's really important to be out in sunlight a lot, okay, for your health. And the good news is that you don't have to be in direct sunlight. What this shows is that light bouncing off of green trees comes into the eyes, it doesn't even have to go through the pupil. It actually penetrates the eyes, and, and uh, most of the light coming in goes around the pupil. And it's specifically green in your environment that is the best reflector of near-infrared. Isn't it a wonder that God didn't make red grass or blue grass? Well, except in Kentucky. But it's green grass, right? This is a picture of near-infrared bouncing off green. So you can literally be standing in the shade outside and have all of this near-infrared reflecting into your body through your clothing. You can have a thick jacket on and still get the benefit of being outside. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to go half naked to get the vitamin D. This is more important, okay? The health benefits, we found that spending time in or living close to natural green spaces is associated with diverse and significant health benefits. It reduces the risk of type two diabetes, heart disease, premature death, and preterm birth, increases sleep duration, and people living closer to nature also had reduced diastolic blood pressure, reduced heart rate, and reduced stress. In fact, one of the really interesting things we found is that exposure to green space significantly reduces people's levels of salivary cortisol, the marker of stress. You have to have cortisol, but you don't have to have so much of it that our, our uh, world. Now, 100 years ago, more than that, they knew this. And so this is Dr. Kellogg, and he ran the Battle Creek Sanitarium. And so Dr. Schwelt uh, showed these, and it says, heliotherapy, or the use of sunlight as a curative means, is one of the oldest natural healing agents. It's only been within the last 20 years, however, that the physiological and therapeutic 
effects of light derived from natural and artificial sources have been made the subject of careful scientific study. Within this period, numerous investigators have devoted themselves to the study on this subject, and the extended research, researches that have been made have resulted in the development of a new class of therapeutic methods, principles, and measures which constitute the science of phototherapy. You remember the photobiomodulation photo studies that I showed you that went up? Well, they only went back to like 1980. It didn't go back to like 1880, okay? If it would have, you might have seen a spike back then. So why did it fall off? With the invention of antibiotics and antivirals and big pharma, the focus was more on, oh, we can make money on these medicines, and there is a place for that. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but this free stuff was not so much in vogue, okay? And so the hydrotherapy, the sunlight exposure, but they actually built hospitals with sunlight exposure beds outside to put people, and this was an orthopedic clinic that they would take their patients out to, and they found that people that had orthopedic surgeries and things did better, and broken bones did better. This is over 100 years ago. And in 1919, when the Spanish flu hit, Dr. Rubel uh, has, talks about his findings, and the army hospitals were the best medicine that you could go to at that time. But when compared to what the sanitariums were able to do with hydrotherapy, fresh air, rest, sleep, sunshine, compared to the army hospitals, if 6.4 people would die out of 100, only one would die at a sanitarium because of these methods, okay? So, if, so my point is, is if another pandemic comes and there is a shortage of antibiotics, a shortage of antivirals, and nothing else you can do, you can go outside. It's free. This was another quote from Ellen White 136 years ago. The feeble one should press out into the sunshine as earnestly and naturally as do the shaded plants and vines. The pale and sickly gr grain blade that has struggled up out of the cold of early spring puts out the natural and healthy deep green after enjoying a few days the health and life-giving rays of the sun. Go out into the light and warmth of the glorious sun you pale and sickly ones, <laughs> and share with vegetation its life-giving, health-dealing power. Isn't that interesting? I think the only reason that they only had 1%, I mean, there was, there, it was still only 6% versus 1%, is because this was in 1919. This is how much near-infrared exposure people got in the 1800s. This is how much we get today. So in 1919 would be somewhere like right in here. These people that were getting sick from the Spanish flu had lots of near-infrared, but getting even more helped, helped. For us down here, if we get sick and that's what we get, the exposure to near-infrared would do us tremendous wonders, okay, compared to what they did in 1919. So in conclusion, there's 10 things that you can do. Dim your lights in the evening. Use more orange or yellow lighting versus the daytime white light. Use even candles or firelight in your house in the evenings. Make sure that your dark mode, night shift mode, is on in your cell phones. You can wear blue blocking lenses, like blue tech lenses at night, but not really in the morning, because you want the blue light to stimulate the, especially the inferior part of your retina, because that sets your circadian rhythm for the day. So getting out before 9 a.m. is beneficial in having the sunlight. So even sunglasses early on, when there's very little UV damage, you don't need sunglasses. Let, let this light in. 
but then when the UV starts to come out, then start wearing your sunglasses. You can even make sure that your lighting is not high. So people that are taking this really seriously now have floor lighting. You've seen in some of the hotels maybe that they have floor lighting at night instead of up, up high. So use daylight bulbs in the morning, like the 500, the white light, the daylight bulbs, but use the yellow bulbs in the evening. Wherever you're gonna spend your evenings, use the more yellow light instead of the bright white. Uh, and then get outside. Go for a walk with green surroundings. Aren't you glad we live in Tennessee and not in Utah or somewhere where they have no green or very little of it? This is what I was talking about. This is what the Sabbath is for. It's your chance to forget about work, forget about the cares of life, go outside with your family, take a walk in East Tennessee in the green. It's very healthy for you. It's not just the fresh air, which is also healthy, but it's healing you at the cellular level. Make sure your bedroom when you sleep is completely dark. No lights at all. If you have to have lights, that's why they make most clocks red, because red doesn't mess with your circadian rhythm uh, as much as the blues and things like that. If you have any blue light in your room at all, get rid of it. And, and make sure you don't dark out shades, and, and even an eye mask uh, can block out that light, and you'll get a much deeper sleep. And move out of the cities. Live in the countries. Live in green spaces. Live in East Tennessee. It seems like a lot of people are moving here, right? So those are the 10 things you can do right there. And uh, I want, so hopefully you learned something tonight. Hopefully, hopefully this is beneficial for you. And uh, this will be, I, it's usually recorded on YouTube. I don't know if it will be or not, but um, you might be able to look back at it and get some more. I want, you, I want to leave you with this thought. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There's no reason any of us need to walk in darkness. Read of him, learn of him, Follow him. And we're told that if we follow him, we won't walk in darkness, but we will have the light of life, and it's better than any light the sun could give. And so I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Let's have a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to learn. And Lord, we, uh, we know that in the last days, we're told that pestilences will increase and, uh, but so will knowledge, and not only uh, knowledge of you, but also knowledge of your creation, and knowledge in uh, how you made our bodies and how you made nature to actually heal us, as we found out tonight. So we thank you for that, and we ask that you um, just be with each person here and protect us as we drive home, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for coming out. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all very much, like he said, for coming tonight. We're going to forego the questions, but if you have any questions. Yeah, you can come you, and talk to me personally. Yeah, just go talk to Dr. Emdy personally. So thank you, Dr. Emdy, very much. That was very enlightening. <laughs> <clears throat> Good night, everyone, and have a safe drive home. And we'll see you on June 11 for Dr. Kretschmar.